Hi. So I guess I start talking now. That's what the pointed finger at me means. I'm Brendan Roy, Painter Prime here at Privateer Press. With me is Josh Cologne, Master and Commander of my heart, but also the No Quarter Prime Editorial Assistant and the penultimate War Machine and Hordes fanboy. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, happy to be back here with my good friend, Brendan. Uh, Tony Konacek is also here. <laughs> I'm also, <laughs> yes, I'm also here. He's also here. Yeah. Um, as you can see, uh, there's a couple pieces in front of me. Uh, this is the Northkin Hooch Hauler that I'm still painting up and I will be painting today on the stream. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and show, show off a little bit of what's been done so far as well as how massive and beautiful this thing really is. Look at the wheels. Oh my God. Nice and wood grain. Nice and neat. The bears, the bears are pretty much painted with the exception of uh, the metal there. Need to do the shading. This is the best fur I've ever had to paint, by the way. Really? Um, yeah, this is sculpted by our in-house sculptor, one of them, uh, Nathan Lombardi, and he nice. did a wonderful, wonderful job. That's amazing. Yeah. Here is the middle section. This breaks down into m different pieces, so sure. if you want to do the sidecars separate, that's a good idea, but trying to get this done as quickly as possible. So. How many pieces does this thing come in? Um, a good amount. A good amount, yeah. <laughs> well, I, uh, it's quite a haul. Yeah, a hooch haul. <laughs> yuck, yuck. So, there we go. Okay, that's gorgeous. Yeah, and that just sits right on top, slits right inside there. And then we got the part I'm actually going to be painting today, parts of it anyways. It's this top little crow's nest session. Oh my gosh. Section. That's amazing. Is that, so, <laughs> that's like a little pig jumping on top of a... Seesaw ready to launch a barrel bomb? Yeah, he's got the thumbs up. He's ready to go. <laughs> just ejects that forward. <laughs> That's like a pro wrestling off. signal. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I'm ready. Yeah, they like the bushwhackers. Hey, yo. I love those shields around the <laughs> crow's nest. Oh, yeah. So, that is the hooch holler, and it all goes together, and it is quite a huge model. It is the centerpiece for sure. So, let's start painting. So I've already went ahead and base coated this this wrapping, this flag, this, I don't know if it's a tartan yet, but it's blue. Mm -hmm. It's getting there. Um, so it's just base coated in exile blue, and I'm going to go ahead and just start shading it with some exile blue mixed with armor shade. So. Get all this ready real quick. So, Brennan, do you feel you've had to use any different techniques in even just prepping this model from what you're usually used to having to do? Um, yeah, we'll say that. Um, definitely trying to speed certain aspects of it along. So having to come up with or use some shortcuts that I wouldn't normally take just to paint it up a little faster since it's such a big model. Um, and I'm going away to ATC this weekend oh yeah that's right so trying to get as much done as possible before i head over there so nice little vacation playing some games so. um was able to airbrush on you might even be able to tell that with some of this uh sure. airbrushed on all the gun core brown for the wood to get the wood started which we have a uh, p3 presents tutorial on how we do wood grain and nice. that's basically exactly what i followed the exception of doing a little bit of airbrushing just to speed along some of the process. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to get in here. Uh, these are like, uh, so this guy, he attaches actually, his hand is holding this peg. Oh, and that peg yeah. is actually what attaches into here with a nice slot. So I could easily have just painted him separately. And right. just, I even pinned the peg in there. Um, it's just like I said, since I'm trying to paint a little faster than normal, um, I decided to assemble as much as I felt comfortable. Right. Um, just and so I don't have to do as much uh, sub assembly later. So. Uh, Brian Jennison on Facebook is asking, right. "What blue are you using for your base color?" Um, What's well, exile blue here on this uh, wrapping it's cloth? Um, is, that, is that what you're referring to? I think so. Yeah. I'm not sure if you meant the blue of the skin of the trolls, but yeah, this is Exile Blue base here, and right now I'm just doing a little bit of shading with Exile Blue mixed with some armor wash. Man. Yeah, and 
this is the last Northkin model I believe we have being released. I think from you the might theme be right. that came out. So. Saving the best for last, as they <laughs> say. That is what they say. So have, have you had a favorite part of painting this yet? Or just really, and the bears were my favorite. Uh, the, um, my favorite. the bears painted very quickly, yeah. so I'm pretty happy with with them in that particular regard. Um, I'm happy with the way the wood's coming out. Um, because the wood grain itself is just etched in there so well into the mold that I actually didn't paint any of it, even mm -hmm. though you can still see it probably from far away. Sure. Um, which is nice since I'm trying to, uh, again, paint a little faster than I normally would. Because I would love to get in there with a brush and actually paint all the little lines of wood grain. But right. That'd be insane, though. Eh, it would look good. <laughs> it would look good. So we got a question from uh, Plarzoid. How did you attach the huge base your paint holder there such large bases are always a challenge for me ah uh, yes um so i'm gonna go ahead and put this down real quick i'm assuming you mean this one here we can see there's actually two bases um there is the top one which is the actual base and then there's this and we just i just use double-sided tape um, on top of the other one and this one is just on top of this cardboard maybe uh paper towel yeah, old paper towel. yeah. um and it's just hot glued on super glued on oh wow yeah and then it's just adhered so that won't go anywhere and then just double-sided tape that on there that's like really that. clever so it's a nice holder and this little lower section here we actually use for the majority of our colossals and gargantuans and huge base models when we're trying to hold it in place or whatnot so it, it gets, sees a lot of use <laughs> that's amazing my shout out to plarzoid i haven't seen you in a long time it's been we haven't hung out in a while mm-hmm So, what is your favorite thing, Josh, about the new Northkin? Man, I don't know. Um, this entire release has been so cool. Like, I, I, I always have a soft spot for characters, right? So, like, Valka Cur Curseborn is like mm. one of my favorite things I think we've ever released, right? But probably, um, I've had a lot of problems with him in uh, Company of Iron. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, I go up against them a lot. Yeah, he's brutal, right? Yeah, like, really he's like, he's a, a monster. Um, but like just even the little, the pig lookouts with the snowman that really always made me, that always <laughs> yeah. made me laugh. Like, <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. I'll that. But I think my absolute favorite thing will probably have to be called Grima Stone Truth's little winter owl thing. Oh, yeah. like, I'm just the thinking about, that's just the best thing ever. Um, but the Hearth God Hooch Holler is like just an amazing, like you said, it's an amazing centerpiece. Yeah. And like I had heard rumblings from the studio like man this thing is huge and like it's like beautiful but it wasn't until i saw it like with my own eyes and i'm like oh my god this yeah. thing is like on i don't know if we've ever released anything quite like this before yeah so um one thing to note which might be hard to actually digest with it in pieces here is that anything else for scale are these are the actual size of all the other releases yeah, right. Trolls. Like it's it's too. So these scale, guys right? are the size of like the pig lookouts. Yeah, it's they're not smaller to compensate. Yeah, it's it's too scale. It's, it's definitely amazing. as too too scale as we can get it. It's amazing. God, it just looks everything about it just, just looks so cool. <laughs> So do you have a th technique you think you're going to be using more on this thing than any other? Like, is this more of like a tube brush bending thing or like a, like an airbrushing thing? Or like, like, what do you see yourself as being the main go-to technique for this piece? Um, I mean, tube brush blending is kind of just our staple technique. It's sure. what, what helps keep, eat with, with our stable of, of painters we've had over the years. It's, it's the thing that's helped tie it all together. So even when you have different artists doing these, you still... They all look like they're a part of the same sure. uh, game and force and army. Um, but outside of that, the airbrush was definitely a huge help. Um, right. I did uh, three different colors. I did Guncore Brown, um, Metal White Base, um, and Battlefield Brown on the bottom. And then I was able to just kind of glaze those together and skip skip a lot of base coating, which was <laughs> sure. very nice and very fast, um, which tied me down. So right now, this is about... This is my third day painting. Oh, man. Um, 
which it feels like it's pretty far along. There's still a lot of metal um, to base coat and a lot of metal to paint. But right. Um, so here I've added uh, to the last exile blue and armor wash shade. I've added a little bit of umber, umber, just for some deep deep shades. But I just want to tie that brown back into this color since there's so much brown. Um, so it doesn't look brown in the mix, but it helps darken it up and it's darken it towards that brownish shade. Do you see yourself using any dry brushing for this piece too? Um, so one thing, I, I gushed a little bit over these fantastically sculpted bears, but one mm -hmm. thing uh, that I really liked about them is um, I was able to quickly navigate washes to brush blending and dry brushing wow. over the same type of fur surface. Like it's, wow. the, it's the perfect fur as far as any technique or all right. techniques you want to use. So I did dry brush a lot of the fur and then wash and then to brush blend and it all just seamlessly just work to my advantage you sound it. like a man in love with these bear furs like, I, I mean, fur, really yeah it's fur is very different across lots of different models and sculptors all approach it differently depending on their medium um, and just the techniques they do it and these this in particular was was a delight to paint as a painter um, Nathan Lombardi did a really good job shout out yeah. shout out Is there any particular piece or pieces you feel that might be the most difficult, right? Like more, most advanced in this piece for uh, for uh, people um, painting at home when they get their hands on it? Uh, well, no, I don't think there's anything that's too difficult, um, especially if you're already used to painting Northkin or Trolls, because they're just bigger, so it's a little easier. Sure. Um, um, to get to, because you don't have quite as much precision that's necessary in other pieces that are smaller um, and it all is, is pretty good so so far I've been happy the thing I would say is like they are heavy pieces so like this is one solid chunk here right um, of resin so it, it that much built is, is heavy um, and I would consider myself a stronger person probably than average more than average sure um, and it still gets you know holding it up for too long it gets a little sore in the forearm um so if you need to feel if you feel like you need to do more sub assembly i would definitely recommend it right i'm um, on this piece in particular um because it could be trying um physically um, we've got uh yeah. we got a couple questions um on facebook and I'll put those up for you right here. Right. But uh, you take a look at those and maybe give these fine people an answer. Sure, yeah. Oops. Once you get it up there. There it is. <laughs> uh, so the first one I see is uh, Martin Granger. Um, he's asking, uh, which you might have be reading, but since I'm not seeing the chat, I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the question is, uh, how, how would you decide to assemble and glue and what to leave off for painting purposes? Um, that's just down to personal mm -hmm. preference. Um, like I said, since I was going for speed, the more that's assembled, the better. Um, and it comes down to what I'm comfortable with experience-wise, where I know I can reach. Like this guy being in front of this could make painting this hard. Right. But I already know that I, the way I can navigate my brush, I'm comfortable getting in there and not actually getting it on the, this pig. Um, so that's not a problem for me. But it might, might be for someone else. Sure. Um, so it's really just down to preference and just, just experience. Right. Choosing what to assemble and what not to. Um, Usually when I'm at home, I don't do sub-assembly because if I can't reach it or I can't see it, I can just paint it. And I also like to use more glue so it adheres faster. Like with this guy, there's a lot of pinning going on um, to make it as secure as possible since it's going to be going to shows and it's going to go on airplanes a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that plays a big part of it. Um, but yeah, mainly just personal preference. Right, and experience. Um, yeah. So if you do something and you sub-assembly like, and you don't, end up liking it and then don't do it again in the future right um or, or if you have trouble painting something and you're not happy with it then in the future maybe, maybe do a little bit more sub assembly right um, break it down a little bit more we also have travis scott asking i recently decided to completely change the scheme i was going on some vein thralls i have them mostly done so my question is which with going with a different paint scheme should i strip the models and start fresh and if so how would you suggest stripping the models um, I don't have a good suggestion for stripping models because um, I don't do it, yeah. which goes to link to the first part of your question is mm -hmm. if there's not a buildup of paint um, 
that it's obscuring so much detail or I don't feel like I can just get away with painting over top. I right. often, even when I've gotten models secondhand in the past, just, repaint just paint right over yeah. top of it. It's already got base coat, it's already got primed. As long as there's not dirt or there's not something that's, um, like I said, obscuring detail. Like if there's so much paint that maybe the teeth of the eyes get blurred away, then maybe you need to you need to For sure. get in there. It also depends on what type. So I, I would do your research because um, everyone's going to come up with something different. But if it's the difference between plastic and resin and metal is going to affect what kind of chemicals or how you should go about stripping it. Um, so what someone might suggest could be limited to metal models in their preference, but they right. don't think about it and then you do it on a resin model and then you might melt some of them. Right. Um, so just do some research and, and uh, just be careful. Maybe try a test before you go a huge bash of them. Yeah. Anecdotally, I, I have not really stripped any miniatures in probably the last 10 years. Right. Um, just, you know, keeping the paints thin, being able to paint right over what uh, whatever it is that you were doing. Or, I mean, in some cases, it's it's a question of effort as well. Right. So it's if you've got a model that, that just absolutely requires stripping, um, just consider getting a new model and starting from scratch rather than trying to recover uh, an old model. And I just throw all my mediocrely painted miles into a volcano. <laughs> that's it's, it's very it could be very ceremonial. Them Setting the them all on gods. fire yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. and starting over <laughs> and is just, uh is but, perfectly acceptable. I just beg forgiveness and start over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's that too. There's always that. Yeah. It's like default option you can go with. Brian Jennison asks and it's kinda of related to an earlier question, would you recommend painting this in pieces? Like all trolls separate, barrels separate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's kind of similar to the other, like how would you go about some assembly? And I, I right. kind of touched on it a little bit. I, um, it's really down to whatever you're comfortable with. Um, whatever you think you're going to be happy with um, painting it. This particular piece, um, it's down to what you want your personal standards for your army, of course. Mm -hmm. um, like it's going to be hard for, I'm going to show you, like, because this guy, since he's so so some assembled, there's stuff I just won't be able to paint. So. Right. So, uh, spoiler, um, mm. the nails on this guy's right foot, and even his foot itself, which you can barely see, which, again, you won't see it. Right. But some people care about this. Um, there's just nothing down there. It's just basically the airbrush. Mm. Um, no one will ever see that, but sure. you guys know. Sure. Um, just, like, underneath, like, there might not be paint or primer on some of that stuff on the very bottom, but you're not going to see it, so it's not a big deal. So that's how I approach sub-assembly, too, if I need to, or if I just want to assemble the whole model. If, are there going to be areas that you can see that I won't be comfortable reaching? Um, and if you can answer that question, yes, then you should probably think about keeping, right. keeping stuff separate. Um, on this, um, I don't think there'll be a problem with sub-assembly. Um, like this guy, he's to show you real quick. I know I'm not doing quite as much painting, but this is just a beautiful big model. Um, this guy, actually, just there's a pin there, which you can see. you probably not on camera. Oh, can I get it there? Well, we have. Oh, I think I can see it there. We have a related question to what you're saying. Right here. We have a related question, the biggest, and which is the biggest question of okay. the day. Is that barrel hollow or not? Is it hollow? Yeah. Um, well, I'm, um, I'm definitely flexing my muscle to be able to keep it up. And this is quite heavy. Um, so while you can paint the sidecar separate, um, it, this will still be a heavy, heavy mm. chunk because it's one solid chunk of resin. Got it. It is a big, uh, big piece. And if it sure, is, yeah. if it is hollow, is it filled with hooch? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> we'll fix that though. If it's not. Um, I'm going to go back to painting a little bit. <laughs> and then this is going to be back to my, I'm going to reclaim here. And what I mean by reclaim is I'm just going back with my base color to uh you know it was a little sloppy and it was fast sure. um, so i can just reclaim quickly um so quick insight into how i paint um i like to paint fast mm -hmm. i'm not a patient person so i'd rather mix up a couple more uh mixes um and just do faster layers and even though i'm doing more it still is faster in the end because i can just clean up as i go and clean up the last layer if it's sloppy right um and reclaiming is a big part of that um and it works out anyways because i'm going to use my base color to mix my highlight colors anyways because I'm going to add colors to it. So I'm going to have it out anyways. So while it's on my palette, I might as well just go back over this real quick. They say that for writers, uh, writing is rewriting. Mm -hmm. Is it true for painters too? Like is painting repainting, right? Like is it like going over and 
and cleaning things after your first pass? Is that something you see yourself doing a lot? Um, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. Like, sometimes it's easy to get absorbed in, oh, this doesn't look good, this doesn't look good. Um, but, like, that can happen when I'm painting the na nails on the bears. Like, sure. oh, these nails don't look good. Like, no one's going to see these nails. Mm -hmm. Like, they're painted fine, but if I, like, need them to be the perfect specimen of what a bear's nails would look like, I'm zoomed in, I'm focused on them, I'm, I'm, I'm tunnel vision, right? Right. Sometimes it's nice to just, just be like, no, no, they're good for now, and then maybe I'll go back, um, which I've done that on the skin, right? Like, on, on, the, on the troll skin. Um, there might be some areas I need it to, to dark line, for sure. <laughs> There's sure. definitely a lot of dark lining on this model to separate the elements. But there might be some areas I need to highlight as well to, to give them a little bit of extra pop. I skip that step for now because I'm going to wait for the whole vision of the model and it to be glued on before I make those decisions. Um, and in that sense, even though I'm done painting the skin and I've moved on, I might not be done painting the skin. Right. So I'll go back and, and uh, add more as I want. So it's definitely not done until it's done um, any part, even though you've moved on. So in that sense, yes, even though I'm doing this element, um, I can go back and, and reclaim like we were talking about. Um, but I can also, I don't feel like when I'm done painting this, that it has to be perfect because um, I don't want to get stuck in that tunnel vision of trying to make it look perfect but it's going to be more than good enough because it's not going to be a focus of the model. Um, and that helps out because when I first started here, that was a big, big hurdle. Right. I wanted everything to look, every element to look perfect. Um, even though there are elements you, you just don't even see. And that, that just takes a lot more time. So. And Brendan, can you come down just a little bit on the oh, screen? Yeah, sure. yeah. I, I moved the, the banner up to the top because it was on down low. So now yeah. no problem. Oh, you mean element? You you mean like the parts of the model that you're trying the to keep? The individual like, elements. Keep it, yeah, yeah, keep it. Good. Like the fire Basic. would be the element. Of, right. Yeah. Don't know if that's the correct term, but that's the one I'm going to be using from mm -hmm. now on. So. Mm -hmm. Josh, do you have any cool uh, troll flax? Flax? It's <laughs> <laughs> not what I meant to say. Facts loaded for us today. So I got. I guess that is why I'm here is to talk a little bit about yeah. the lore of the North Cannon. Perhaps the the hooch holler. I would say that you were here to hang out with us. Well, sure, but I guess a perk a perk of having me here would be I can see here and sit here and talk a little bit about it. So, um, to start very simply is that um, Hearthgut from the name of the Hearthgut hooch holler. Hearthgut is actually a creel. It's actually a uh, its own individual creel. Uh, we don't know a lot about them quite yet. We 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 probably will me, might be exploring them in the future. Um, it's probably likely that they were one of the first to um, employ modern hooch haulers as they are today, right? Um, I was I was talking to Getz a little bit about it, and, and I, I kind of feel like that, like that the the hooch haulers kind of came up about by accident, right? A, a bunch of like troll kids kind of going from village to village, carrying their their delicious and and important you know booze and and to keep it from getting raided they'll just keep adding more and more armor and more and more weapons <laughs> to it right until they eventually they realize like wow we can make this into a, a weapon of war and also light the some of the stuff on fire although i'm sure they're reticent to use too much of their booze uh you know in the fire sprays because they want to be able to drink it afterwards right yeah, yeah that's a good right. question how how far do you go with your ammunition when that is also used for celebration i like to imagine it's like a really desperate last resort right they're like oh i guess fine i guess we'll <laughs> use this <laughs> thousand proof alcohol to burn a few northerners alive um but yeah and so they're they're definitely very popular and in the diorama we have in no quarter prime number two of uh, north kin village you'll see that we have um most north kin villages or the standard village has a hooch holler basically parking spot just a a, a parking lot for where you can have different hooch hollers you know to crack open and enjoy the alcoholic deliciousness as it were I would like to be a troll. Yeah, I think that's. I think a lot of people, if they, had, they could get transported into our setting, would you know? I mean, let's see. You're big. You have a lot of regenerative powers, right? Like it takes a lot to kill you. They have the best parties. They have the best parties, right? Um, you know, they they they. I mean, they, they have a whole specific like ability, right? Like fell calling, right? It's all like unique to their own. 
I mean, being a troll is pretty sweet in the Iron Kingdoms. You know, besides the whole being displaced from your homeland and constantly in warfare and harangued and, and, harangued and, yeah. and yeah, you know, that, that whole bit. But other than that, it's really sweet, <laughs> I think. That's what I think, anyway. Yeah. So has this over... I, I, I know I've kind of asked this in a different way, but like... Is, has this been different from painting any other larger, you know, huge base models in the past for you? Like, is this a unique project for you? Because I know you did the, uh, didn't you do the Sea King? Was that you? I also did the Sea King. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That model um, is fantastic. Also big. Also big, um, right? Troll, trolls get to be bigger than everything else. Mm -hmm. so they, um, get a lot more. Um, no, I wouldn't say because, like, because uh, our, our theme release so far, at least the models I've painted out of them have been very element heavy. Sure. Um, which is great, um, but I'm very much looking forward to uh, what we've come. We, have, we just came out the CID for Legion, um, right? And I have um, dedicated myself to Legion this year. I'm oh going wow! To ATC with the Legion lists. Um, 2018 is your Legion I year. Will, I will continue painting. By the way, I'm just mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, moving on to add some frostbite to my to my base color here. Of exile blue, um, and they're less heavy in the elements as like trenchers or um, or cricks, mm -hmm. pirates. Yeah, you know, there you have a lot of like feathers and studded can. leather and. Yeah, so yeah. Um, they're beautiful models. Oh, you can't wait for you guys to see them. But um, it's gonna be a nice little break. This guy is kind of the last hurrah, I suppose, of, of, the, of the Northkin. Um, sure. Because the Northkin, um, or personal preference to me, because our new painter painted up some of them, uh, the troll lights, um, as well as the, the pigs, but the rest of them were, I was, for the moment, so with Dallas transitioning into studio manager, was the only studio painter for a moment, and then I painted up the majority of them, um, and I was there from the beginning of the process for, like, color recipes, because I was able to navigate the color recipes, so it's it's a more personal, it feels sure. more like my army, because right. like, the trenchers already had their recipes um, in place, so it's still a lot of following our, our core studio ones, and the uh, Northkin, I was able to kind of do my own thing, so to speak, um, since we didn't have a lot of Northkin models out there, um, so this is kind of like the penultimate finishing of that that's the, the bookend right so to speak so it's a good the end so in that in that regard that's what's unique about this model as far as all the other ones are like this like it's, it's almost it's, it's more personal than you, all the other ones yeah you sense. got to kind of build yeah. some of the color scheme yeah. right that was used and the color formulas and the recipes yeah, yeah. So. that's wonderful have you had a chance to do something similar for um legion or not so much um not so much i mean they're they're, they're still kind of written in um there are recipes that were used that we don't they're lost to, to the nulls of time at this point really so we get to try to figure them out um but i have another we have the other painter jordan lamb he's uh also going to be helping figure those out we, or come up with them recipes that look exactly the same um because there's different colors to them we have we don't have ogren often as releases um so this is kind of going to be really cool coming forward with all the ogren coming out but they kind of have their own color purple leather that you got to figure out and stuff like that. That's really great. That's pretty exciting. Do you usually like save the fire for last? Um, I do. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because I get to do all the OSL, and I don't want elements not painted when I'm glazing on the overglow. Uh, OSL being object source lighting, so it's like the 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 uh, radiation of or the radiant. Mm -hmm. energy coming off the fire and i think this fire starts blue because it's alcohol burn right no that makes sense so it's going to be different wow. than any other fire that's really cool that's really cool yeah so that's going to be fun research maybe uh maybe actual research yeah at home in my backyard as well oh sorry so. well so when the cops come for you know setting yeah. neighbors yards on fire you'll be like i was doing At research matt wilson's fault yeah yeah. I was on the clock. And they'll be like, who? you like, you don't understand. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> it's okay. All right. So uh, it looks like you're doing highlights now. Did I miss that I, part? I am I'm doing highlights. Yeah. I added some frostbite to okay. uh, my Exile Blue. Exile Blue. So okay. Go, yeah. So back to Exile Blue. 
Yeah. So this is a cloth, so I'm being a little, uh, trying not to be too smooth with my blends here in True Brush Blending, which usually you want to, but it, it's textured cloth, so I don't mind it having a little scratchiness on right. there and there, kind of like leather. Leather I usually paint mm -hmm. on, and this I'll kind of just feather down the, the, the blend itself. I mean, it gives it those streaks. That way it can kind of simulate like fabric. Right. That the woven fabric a little bit more um, as opposed to a perfectly smooth blend, which looks pretty, um, but isn't entirely accurate in this case. So just giving the impression of it. Ed Burrell is in the chat. Hello, Ed. Oh, nice. He's wondering where Dallas is at, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I think oh, when it's done, the hooch holler is going to look really good with, like, the fire eaters, you know, next to the fire eaters and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Like, like I kind of kind of want to pick up one for myself and, like, Try, although I'm, I'm a little intimidated, but I won't lie, like, it'd be kind yeah, of fun to just fine. try. Yeah. I'll paint yours up. Oh, yeah? No. Nah, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> I got really excited there for a second. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll watch you throw yours into the, uh... The volcano. The volcano yeah. later, but... That's great. <laughs> Help me do the ceremony. Yeah. Maybe the fire and the volcano will turn blue yeah. for a second. Yeah. You'll, you'll know you did right. That's all part of the plan. I can't imagine how heavy this thing's going to be when it's all put together, though. Oh, uh, yeah. I've uh, picked up the altogether model. Um, it's not bad. It's better than if it was all metal. I'll give you that. Yeah, yeah that <laughs> makes sense. But on the plus side, it won't slide around too much on the table. Ed says, hi, Brendan, and thanks hi. for not going on and on about pancakes. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, right. I forgot. Um, so, pancakes. Mm-hmm. Uh, no. <laughs> Practice and perseverance. Yeah. My three P's would be pancake, pancake, pancake. Mm -hmm. It's easy to remember. Yeah. What is your favorite little tidbit of knowledge about Northkin or just trolls in general? Is there, like, one little... Well, what I like about the Northkin is that... Um, I mean, the, the trolls are always getting kind of like the short end of the stick a lot. Mm -hmm. But North can have it like hardest than ever, right? Like it's really hard living up there in the north, right? Like it's really like, like a raiding is like a way of life, right? Because resources are so, so scarce, right? So they have to be really hardy and they have to be kind of like more brutal, mm -hmm. right? So the, the while, while you see some like slight modernization in some of the southern creels, right? You got like... People like Captain Gunbjorn and, you know, some of, like, the, 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 the really more, more modern technology. You can't really do that up in the north, right? You don't really have access to that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So so the, the, the north kin are kind of, like, the closest to, like, the traditional old school trolls that we've seen in a really long time. I think that's really neat. They also have mm -hmm. snow owls. They do. And great northern white bears. Yeah, that's true. There's so much to love. There's so much to love. I watch uh, a unit of battle bears ambush from the side and one round old rowdy. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So, um, and this was after their official rules got released. Um, unfortunately, I was too busy to actually look at their rules um, too much over the course of the CID and stuff and how they were changing. Um, but I was thoroughly impressed. <laughs> yeah, that sounds, that sounds yeah. unbelievable. Um, and the opponent that got old rowdied, um, destroyed, probably will never will remember they have ambush from now on. Mm -hmm. now. Yeah, yeah, do not forget yeah, that part. They're uh, pretty awesome. Do a lot of damage. So we got a question from Martin Granger. Um, he is asking, what is the best way of gluing painted parts 
to other painted parts? Do you have to scratch the paint for a better bond for the glue or just go ahead and glue it together? Um, we'll find out. <laughs> uh, uh, so as you can see here, um, um, under here is just, there's a pin under, there's two pins under there to stabilize this piece in particular to this, the holder, what I'm using. Um, but neither of those pins, I'm just going to cut them at the base um, and, and make sure they're flush with the bottom of this because this pin here is the pin I'm going to use for the guide um, and to be the main securing point of this under there. So while this is this is taller than the hole is, um, I, can, I, I can always drill deeper if I need to. Um, I'll just snip this when I'm done, but I also want this here. And it's extra long in this particular case, so I don't forget <laughs> why it's there. And I don't accidentally paint it or, or whatever. It's just right. a nice little bookmark. Um, and then on the bottom here, you can see two pretty large pins. Um, the one in the center here is the one I'm actually going to use to pin inside. And then this one I'm actually going to cut flush as well. And then maybe put a little bit of really dark paint to, to block it from view. Um, and then that pin will slot into this hole that I've drilled there. Um, and I'm hoping I lined it up perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> um, otherwise, that'll be a different, <laughs> uh, a different conversation um, and fixing that I'll be going through. But that'll slot into there. Um, and then this will just also hold the base and I can glue there. But the pin itself, both of those pins that I just um, talked about, those are going to be the main thing that adheres it to, um, which is going to mean I, I don't need to uh, feel, I don't think I'll need to do too much scratching um, and gluing from that point, which you can, of course, like it's sure. not going to hurt to have more glue. Um, your goal is just to make sure it sits flush um, in the end and the glue doesn't flow out on top of the painted parts that you just painted. Um, so less is more in that particular instance. So that's why the pins are so um, deep and, and then they'll do a good job of that. Um, so mainly pinning is how I'd answer that question. After I'm excessively descriptive. <laughs> what uh, in a situation where you had like a, a part that would either be difficult or too time consuming to to pin if it was small or something else like that. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if you were just going to put two surfaces together with no support, what would you suggest? Um, then I would I would score with like a uh, exacto knife or razor blade sure. or a hobby knife, uh, both sides, um, and then I would just glue it on. A lot of the times, contact part I would use our uh, P3 putty, mm. our brown stuff. There's another nickname for it. Um, and I use a little, little dab of it. Um, right. And then I'll use that to, to, to hold the connection between right. the two surfaces while the glue dries. Right. Um, and, I, and I do that all the time because I don't like sitting there waiting for the glue to dry. Then I can move on to painting other things and whatnot um, in the interim. So we have a question from Alec M. Luda. Um, so fluff-wise, would they be more susceptible, like I was assuming the Cholkin, to fire because of the northern lifestyle, asking for the Iron Kingdoms? Um, probably not. Um, otherwise, the North Kingdom fire eaters would be in real big trouble. Um, but in, in setting-wise, um, traditionally, um, fire was used because it is believed to have um, effects on the Trollkin's regenerative abilities. Um, like back in the ancient days of the Mulgar, when like the human Mennonite priest kings were fighting against um, the alliance of like the Trollkin and Ogren and stuff, they would use fire weapons because they thought it would actually like dampen the, the healing regenerative abilities of Trollkin. So like so occasionally you will see Trollkin that don't regenerate an eye or a hand because it's been that badly burnt. Right mm -hmm. now, obviously, that's a kind of a case by case basis, but um, but in general, yeah, fire is is, is not good for trollkin. But um, some of the hardiest kin can, of course, overcome anything by the blessing of Dunya yeah. and their belief in the, the kiss and creed the pyre beyond troll is just pain. A, beyond pain, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the pyre troll is just pyre troll. Uh, for they, example, they, they, like, they, they adapt to their they adapt. To, yeah, so. exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, and bro, the ancient days of the D20 system, yeah. Back <laughs> in the old school IK, yeah, the Trollkin definitely uh, took a little bit more damage from fire. That is right. Poor guys. Poor guys. But well, not that much. And not enough to not be terrifying in every other way. And to not go extinct. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. 
Look at all that sweet fur and all that sweet cloth. So what's a, is this a, one of those models um, where you can end up getting most of your large base coats and, and first layers in very fast and then end up spending a lot of time kind of tightening up the, the so, details? Yeah. Um, definitely. I mean, you can definitely get, like I said, tunnel vision. You can easily get lost in, in an element, even no matter how small it is. Um, but this is also a big model. So, like, for shading purposes, um, a lot of this would just be natural shading. Um, even even in our, in our studio photography, uh, in our light box, there's just going to be natural shadows that are going to form because there's so much overlap mm -hmm. and, and stuff. So I'm going to try to use that to my advantage. <laughs> but on the tabletop in a non-studio environment, you could base coat this, I'm sure, and put it on sure. in a hobby table and as long as it's not fluorescent lighting and, and with a short, and a sh uh, small roofed environment. Right. You can probably get away with like, it looks, it'll still just look great even with just base coats. Um, and then base coats and a wash and a highlight and don't even talk about it. It's going to look amazing <laughs> because of just how many, much natural shadows you're going to get from the model itself, um, which is helpful. I don't think that's uh, something we've talked about very much on Get Your Paint On is that uh, the importance of shading a miniature. I mean, obviously, we've covered shading a lot. Right, But the right. why you need to have that contrast at that scale. Can you talk a little bit about why it's important to have that shade on a miniature because of the size? Oh, uh, right. I mean, uh, I mean, the reason why you paint shades and, and highlights on a miniature is because it is a small version and, and our lights are towards the reference of scale of what we are as humans and our sizes. Um, so the way it reflects off of the miniature is going to be different the way it interacts. And the, and the elements aren't the same. Right. It's not actually leather. It's plastic. So it's going to interact with light differently anyways, even if you put an acrylic layer on top. But then you have the acrylic layer, or I'm assuming you're using acrylic paints. Hopefully you are. Uh, is going to have its own sheen and it's going to interact with the light differently as well. And then, then you're going to have natural shadows that are going to be different because of the, the way the light source is, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of different reasons, but it's scale. And then you talk about distance. Like if a person's in front of you, the natural lighting and the inflections, the actual life, right? Like shade doesn't right. have to be color. It can also be tone. It can mm -hmm. be, uh, or it doesn't have to be uh, value. Sorry, it doesn't have to be light or dark. You're not actually painting shadows, but sometimes just the redness of something's face would be a quote unquote shade, be a contrast that you're applying through color, um, which you don't get if you just do a foundation color. So there's reasons like that. You're trying to emulate what you see in real life. But as far as in reference to what you're referring to, Tony, um, the way it, like like the underside of this for example like in here if i can get it um the just is the natural shadow which normally doesn't occur on smaller models like the natural shadows of this guy because he's leaning over will occur down here so i can get away with less shades because it's already gonna no matter right. how the light comes in unless the light actually can tuck in there because the light will interact differently because the light is created for human size reference and blah blah, blah. right so it's not so much of uh you're just trying to emulate, like, if this was real, how would light interact with it if I zoom it up to my eyes? So you're painting on shades and highlights with the way you want to see it and, and show it show it off, right? So that's why a contrast is important for miniatures, because usually it's something this far away. So you can see contrast, you can see shades and highlights, but if it was just base coats that far away, light wouldn't interact with it the same way, so it, would, it would, wouldn't pop as much. So that's why you use contrast and pop in those things. You're just trying to make it look um, um, real from further away. So you're controlling the lighting, and that's all it really is, is you're trying to um, create an environment where you have dictation over um, how someone perceives the model. So like anything so. else, so it looks good on a tabletop, right? Mm -hmm. Like essentially. Yeah. And sometimes your place you play at might not have great lighting, and then you can get away with... Uh, I don't want to say get away with like it's a bad thing, but you can you can orchestrate that to your advantage when you're right. playing your army because you don't have to do quite as much to make it look good when you're playing your friends. Um, or if you, you're in a basement or depending on the types of lights you use, um, which a lot of times like the way so the light will interact with things, you'll be like, oh, well, it looks good when I take a picture of it. Or it looks good when I when I when my camera takes a picture of it, but in person it's not as good. You're like, cool, keep taking pictures of it with your camera. Like, <laughs> that sounds great. Um, you know, it's just everything interacts differently. Or if, if this wasn't a daylight, if this wasn't white light in, the, in here in our studio, we're painting now. If it was yellow light, fluorescent light, desk light from a lamp or something, it's going to look different because it's a different color reflecting and blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's just light. I mean, that's just all a part of how that stuff works. Um, but 
we're trying to, in the absence of light, uh, if everything was just, if light came from all directions and it was white, which is, you know, how it's photographed, try to dictate how these shades would look and, and how your eye perceives everything and try to make it look realistic. And that's why we in the studio will paint a certain way, but it might not work as well on the tabletop because you're painting towards, you know, that far away, that distance, which natural shadows can come into that because you're, you know, you're not constantly going to have light surrounding in a light box situation. Um, rambling. Here. What an amazing, <laughs> but, <laughs> what an amazing game that would be if you played on a table with a full light box it's all the around time. him. Yeah, right. but you have to co constantly adjust the lights because models would get in the way of other oh, yeah. models. Yeah. Oh yeah, that'd be uh, that'd be weird. It's a sixteen-hour game <laughs> of War different. Machine. Yeah. So we got the very in-depth explanation from Brendan, uh, but Aggie <laughs> offered a one-sentence explanation. Says because it looks gooder. Because it looks good. Which is it also good. absolutely true. Accurate. Because yeah. it looks good. Accurate. <laughs> very accurate. But that's why it looks good. Yeah. <laughs> the science behind the gooder. No, not that there was science there, but <laughs> um, the overthinking behind the gooder. I'm going to call it science. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to make up my own definitions. <laughs> As long as you qualify what you're talking about, you can totally do that. Yeah, totally. But Brendan, what if you painted all those individual nails on the, that board? On the what? On the board, like on the planks. Oh yeah. Like if you painted, what if you painted all those, your table? How you're not painting any of the individual nails on it? Oh. But what if you did? Yeah. Well, I'm gonna paint these ones. Are you really? Yeah, yeah. Oh my god. Well, I mean, they're there. They're a different element. They're mm. nails. They're not wood. So we paint that. You're, you're referring to like, what if I paint every individual line of, of the wood grain? Yeah. Which normally I would. Um, you're a mat man. Well, that's my job. <laughs> um, but I'm getting away with not doing it. Mm hmm. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to finish and then someone's like, someone being Dallas. Um, it's like, no, no, no. We need that wood grain on there. And be like, all right, well, give me another couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, uh, it was someone I was going to bring up before too, is, um, you know, when you're working on a project and there's all those details to kind of hit and just, you know, looking at it, getting overwhelmed. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we talked before about taking it one step at a time, just working one part of it. But then the other is, you know, you can also pick your battles on your miniature a little bit. If there's yeah. a part that is not the focus of your miniature, uh, or even better, isn't really visible. Right. There's yeah. no need to spend a lot of time on it. I mean, certainly if you, you know, you want to go all out all over on it, then then fantastic. But, you know, the back of a shield, the underside of something that, you know, you can't really see if you don't flip over the model or or even just a part of the model that, that isn't a place where people are really going to be inspecting. You know, no need to spend a lot of time. Um, yeah, I mean, I had a class talked about color color theory, which went into kind of composition and what you look at when you see a model uh, in War Machine Weekend. I had this class and um, we'll see if I have <laughs> more of them. Um, seem to have gone well. Uh, but it, you know, that kind of goes into it where like when you bring the focus point to like, like faces, like people want to look at faces. Um, so making sure the face looks good. Um, you draw, but that just draws more attention to the face, especially when you have higher contrast. You can put sure. higher contrast values in there um, to, to, to direct people to it. Um, super saturated colors, like really bright reds, yellows, just bright colors, basically. Um, this is what I mean by saturated, um, for the most part. Um, also draws attention. Um, so you have, and then you have values, and then higher values, like white, the color white. The closer it gets to white, the more attention it draws. So if you have a um, super high value white face that starts with like a really bright yellow and red face, <laughs> um, you're going to draw attention to that face constantly. So you can get away with everything else being base coated and washed. And if it looks really good, you know, you just like orchestrated everyone to always look at that face and they'll navigate away and around to other stuff, but they'll, they won't, they'll notice that it's painted and they'll see that it's painted, but they'll keep going back to that face. So in that regard, you can get away with it. Um, there are tricks we can get away with in the studio like that as well. Um, but in the studio, it's a, f it, it's a photograph. Um, so we also have to play the line of like, well, if someone sees how terribly painted something is, they might, you know, make a meme out of it. <laughs> which um, we can play that game. We can play the, the what did someone get away with uh, studio painter wise? <laughs> you guys have extra time. You're like, what was this? Because um, um, things get forgotten. We're humans. <laughs> we make mistakes. Um, but we make mistakes and then it's photographed and then it's released to the world. And, then and it's there forever. It yeah, it's there forever. So, 
which is a consequence of being a studio painter here at Private Chip. Um, but for a tabletop, yeah, like just get that face look good, and then you can orchestrate other things around it to not be as well painted, but no one will care or notice because that one element looks really good. And like faces and skin, um, really good. Like when I painted up my troll buzz, I just kind of did this quality of skin, um, and then everything else was like paste coated and washed. And no one really noticed until I pointed out, be like, yeah, you didn't really look at the wood there. <laughs> it's like w two colors, and it looks terrible. Like, oh yeah, it does look terrible. Like, yeah, but you didn't really care because you kept looking at the skin and the tattoos and right. little highlights and little tricks. So. All right, we're coming up on the last 10-ish uh, minutes of our stream today. So if you guys have questions, comments, anything you want to throw into the chat, let us know. We will, we will uh, get those answered for you. All right, Josh, what is your favorite? This is, this is a very important question. Who is your favorite troll blood character? Ooh, uh, man, that's tough. Probably Scaldy Bonehammer. Right. Um, <clears throat> so I, I like him because he's kind of an underdog. Because back in the and he, it's still part of his character, but not. I think it's kind of downplayed a little bit. Um, but when he first came out, his whole goal was to be um, like the rival to Borka. Right, but it's just like, oh, Scaldi, you're not gonna, yeah. you're not a you're warlock. Not a <laughs> you're, you know, you. I'm sorry, buddy. Like it's like, but I like that he kept trying. You'll never get your bear. You'll never get your bear. <laughs> yeah. So he, you know, so I, but I like that he kept, you know, like what the, I think one of the only times they interacted, like they, he was like that awesome like rival character, who was like really chipper and like thought he could win, you know. So so I love Bone Hammer quite a bit actually. I think. Um, I also like that he carries his own keg, but it's like a completely different shape mm -hmm. and size. Like, yeah, you know, I got my own thing going on here. It's all good, you know. Um, but Scaldi's probably Scaldi's up there. I like Gunbjorn. I love the idea of a military troll blood character too. Um, and he's, he's got like a big gun. legit big trained in the military, right? Yeah, he used like, he's a trencher. Yeah, he was a trencher. Um, Mad Drac, right? He's the tragic hero. Yeah. Um, Calandra, she's like the optimist, right? She's like the, 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 the tarot card reading optimist all the mm. time. And then you've got, um, Gristle. If I had Starcross, that would also always be an optimist. That is true. Yeah, if I had Starcross, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got this, guys. Um, and I, in the, in the Martu story, while Mantrak was off doing his own thing, um, it was, um, Gristle that was kind of like leading the Creels in his stead. So I like the idea that, like, She's the only one like competently keeping everyone together for like two years, like, like, but getting very little credit for it. Mm -hmm. um, so that role, that character always makes me laugh, like that concept. <laughs> but what about you? What do you have a favorite troll blood character? Um, I I I don't know as much about his fluff as I like, but Jarl. Is oh yeah, my favorite. Oh yeah. Um, the devil of the devil thornwood. Of thornwood. Yeah. yeah uh, he was my first troll blood caster sure. I ever painted up. Everyone was like, he sucks. And I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't matter. He's a gun mage, essentially. Yeah, he's a gun not, mage. Not a literal gun mage. Yeah. He's the untrained un, uh, gun yeah, mage. He's an um, untrained, a primal gun mage. I would love was. a Jarl too, where it's oh, like, yeah. oh, you know what? He went to school. Yeah. So now he's got magic bullets. Oh, yeah. Not just the spell, but actual, actual magic bullets. Um, Everything about him, I mean, the highwayman type approach. I just, I just love that. I love that whole unit, the, high, the highwayman. Yeah. Oh god, they're so cool. Yeah, like that. That's. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna gush for the last couple minutes, but there you go. <laughs> no, that, uh, I, a character that we haven't seen, like I don't think anything of, but she fits that same thing. Was a uh, brilliant Wonderheart or whatever. The, oh, the yeah. yeah, she's like the the, the gunslinger. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I like the bandit look of her. She's got, got like the face covered and like right, like she's gonna draw. Like, yeah, she, do you have a favorite yeah. troll blood character, Tony? Um, there? I do not. Oh, um, yeah. Well, you can leave. Yeah, <laughs> exit now. I can't. Right. This, this place will run itself. But and then, then is... I'll ask the audience what your favorite troll blood character is. Yeah, and I'll read us. your comments later, and yeah. I'm sure we all will. And I would love to love to see what everyone's favorite is because there's so many out there they're so they're so rich like i know someone that loves doomy oh yeah because he's sure. just the he's just the, the old angry man yeah the cranky yeah. old man he's real good um but super 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 powerful super powerful cranky yeah. old man 
um, a, a, a troll blood character you love or a troll blood character you love to hate, right? Let us know in the comments. <laughs> Plarzoid apparently took a little break, uh, came back to the stream and wants to know why you're not done with that yet. <laughs> um, well, it is actually. We're just going to use uh, some of our design team to Photoshop in the rest of the colors. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we'll just go with that. It's so, so. That's how it gets done. There is there was one last question, and I don't know if you covered this before. Sometimes I'm bouncing in between mm -hmm. these windows, but um, J Herb five thousand in Twitch wanted to know uh, if you covered how the wood barrel was painted. Um, the wood barrel. Um, yeah. So this here, um, with the exception of the wood grain, I'm assuming you're referring to the, the big cake here. But all the wood was painted exactly the same, so it doesn't really make a difference. Um, this is just larger to show you on camera. Um, we have a wood grain video on our P3 Presents. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll post um, that link, actually. Yep. And with the exception of maybe some colors, because um, I, I added some Menoth white base, because um, normally we, uh, in the wood grain video, I talk about using Menoth white base to paint your lines on the grain for the highlight before right. you do your glazes and your shading. Um, here, I actually just use it as a, as a, as a uh, directional highlighting with the, with the airbrush. So I kind of just came at it from the top, and you can see some of it. Um, and if we get up close, you can actually see some of the texture, but that's fine because wood has that type of texture. I'm using that to my advantage. The same type of idea I had when, when I painted up the, uh, the Dracodile was um, this texture is okay that I get from the overspray of the airbrush because I actually want to work that into um, the, the modeling and the stuff like that and then the wood here. As long as it's consistent. If it's just a random dot, right, it, it, doesn't, have to be, it doesn't have to be a pattern on repeat, but as long as it... it you're trying to convince the eye that this is this belongs here. Sure. So if you just have like a random dot here and there's nowhere else, that sticks out like a sore thumb, right? But if it starts bleeding in, you can hopefully get away with uh, uh, having it on there. So cross your fingers. Let's <laughs> see how that works. Um, but that you know enabled to use the airbrush. But with the exception of that, it, that that video tutorial basically goes over how it happened. Um, um, you, know, you can that find grain. that and yeah. a lot of other tutorials on YouTube. Yeah. On our There's also some Ruxic Tan. Um, so when you look at that tutorial and you're like, well, yours looks yellower. Um, well, it's because I used Ruxic Tan um, and didn't use quite as much blue ink in the final shade, which will make more sense if you watch that video. Um, just to control the colors, but it's the same technique, same idea. So. Shirley says he likes it better than anything he's ever painted before, and it's only a barrel. It is only a barrel. But, you know, hopefully eventually someone's going to hollow it out and uh, add some real hooch. Yeah. Yeah, real hooch holler. <laughs> Privateer Press does not endorse filling a resin model with hooch, but uh, we if do you not. do that, no. you have a thumbs up from me, personally. Yeah, of course. We do not have a tutorial coming for that, <laughs> nor do we recommend it. Um, we will not be held liable. Swallowing liquid resin. Words bits. need to be used to yeah. point that out a little better. <laughs> Plarzoi <laughs> says, this thing needs more shields. Got to protect the hooch. There's yeah. there, I, more shields than are on there already. That's definitely a lot of shields. It's quite a bit. Yeah. But I bet you, I bet, it uh, does feel like a testament to their fallen brethren. Oh, yeah. As well. Plarzoid, I bet you could uh, get a bunch of shield pieces and fit them on there yourself. Plenty of room. And show us that conversion when you're done. Yeah, that's cool. Like, even the bears have alcohol. Oh, Hold on. I got to hold that yeah, there. I gotta I gotta really, uh, grab that focus. There. there we go. Look at that. Look, boom. Go. Movie magic. See all that natural sh shading that I was talking about? Yeah, it looks amazing. Kegs everywhere. Can't have mm -hmm. enough. Not when you're hauling. Hooch. Well, I think that is it, right? Oh, one, one, one last question. One question. Alec M. Luda, just uh, we're going to close the stream out with this, uh, wants to know what we're doing for lunch after this stream. Oh, yeah? yeah. Well, I made some uh, pesto chicken pasta that I have leftovers from. So that's what I'm doing for lunch. That's amazing. <laughs> See, I wish I could. I could say like the, the Hollywood private your press thing. Like, well, we're gonna go get a steak lunch. You know, our typical oh, right, yeah. weekly steak. No, no, lunch. no, no. I changed my answer. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. Or I could say the real thing where it's like I got a couple noodles <laughs> in my desk, and it's gonna be real good. Can I heat up in a microwave? 
and uh, that'll be delicious. So you, you accept the the lunch invite from Pagani, and you go somewhere fancy. That, that is, is true. that is true. If Pagani okay. asks you out to lunch, or you're you going someplace fun. Crack open your little cupboard you keep at your desk, and, and pop that hot water and that ramen. <laughs> it all works. It's all food. The balancing factor. Mm -hmm. so. And with that, we are going to wrap it up for the day. So, Brendan. Will you uh, tell everybody goodbye and take us out? Goodbye and take us out. I had a great time painting, um, as always, on this nice little stream for you. I had a great time with you, Josh. Uh, thank you for having me. It was a great pleasure to be here. And Tony, you were present. Yes, you I was, also, I was yeah. also here. You were present. So and thank you for joining us, if you did. And thanks for watching now, whenever that is, if it's not live. Mm -hmm. And catch us next week. Or catch us every Thursday, every Thursday. 10 a.m. Pacific time. And, and I hope to see you at ATC, by the way. So if you're there, please come and Ooh, yeah. greet us. Well, and if they want their own hooch holler, how do they yeah. get their hands on it? Uh, it Black, Black Anchor, Anchor Heavy. I'm wearing the shirt now. Black actually. Anchor Heavy Industry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's on Great our site. Mm -hmm. Follow the link. Pick yours up. You get a koozie with it. It's awesome. <laughs> Excellent. So see you guys next time. All right. Thanks for watching. Day and weekend. Right. Thank you, Bye. guys.